Mark Salzer. I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Rehabilitation Sciences at Temple University, and I'm also the director of the Temple University Collaborative on Community Inclusion of Individuals with Psychiatric Disabilities. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for a webinar called uh, Supporting College Students with Psychiatric Disabilities. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so you or your colleagues will be able to take a look at it uh, in the future. And in a second, I'll uh, give you a sense of the objectives that I hope we're able to uh, cover today, uh, probably in the next 45 to 60 minutes, uh, about how we can best support college students with psychiatric disabilities. Uh, but first, I wanted to let you know that I have reserved some time at the very end of this webinar for your questions and comments. Uh, what we would like you to do is uh, you can go over to the chat box and uh, click on, I think, all panelists or all participants, and you should be able to write your questions and comments uh, right there. And I will be able to take a look at them uh, later on and be able to go through each question uh, individually. Uh, we currently have the microphones muted. Uh, that's to primarily prevent any background noise or uh, anything like that from, uh, from occurring. Um, um, so uh, with that, I would like to move ahead and uh, start this presentation. Um, so first of all, I wanted to start out with our objectives for uh, today's webinar. The objectives are to examine campus experiences and knowledge and use of various types of accommodations that college students with serious mental illnesses uh, uh, utilize and what their experiences are on college campus. We also will review the campus engagement and academic supports that college students find to be most helpful. And finally, we'll discuss the types of supports that can be offered and barriers that need to be addressed to uh, better support or best support for college students with serious mental illnesses. Um, the background for this conversation, uh, for those of you who don't come from the uh, mental health field or aren't, uh, aren't uh, working directly in clinical practice or other ways with individuals with serious mental illnesses, and by the way, I use that term to include people uh, diagnosed with psychotic disorders like schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorders and affective disorders, including bipolar disorder and major depression. Um, over the last 20 or 30 years or so, there's been a real revolution in our understanding of the uh, capabilities of these individuals and the ability of these individuals to what some people have come to call recover from their mental health issues that the they're dealing with. Um, this uh, recovery notion is, uh, is understood from two different perspectives. The first is what's called a medically oriented perspective. Uh, this perspective tries to understand recovery from the extent uh, to which individuals with serious mental health issues have uh, fewer symptoms over long periods of time uh, or have increased uh, functioning, including going to work or going to school dating, those kinds of things, as well as uh, decreased hospitalizations or fewer hospitalizations over time. From this more medically oriented, fully oriented perspective, the data are very clear that individuals with significant mental health issues, including those who have been diagnosed uh, with schizophrenia, can recover. Uh, people do experience fewer symptoms over time. People People can uh, uh, participate in the community, uh, sometimes to the same degree as other people who don't experience these issues. And uh, people experience decreased hospitalizations over time. Uh, so again, from a medically oriented perspective, we have ample evidence that uh, people can recover. There's also, also another perspective on recovery. This is often called the consumer-oriented perspective. This perspective understands recovery uh, as being separate from someone's experience with symptoms related to a diagnosis or uh, a mental health issue that they're experiencing. And my favorite definition associated with consumer-oriented perspectives on recovery is that it refers to one's uh, ability to live a satisfying, fulfilling, and hopeful life 
with or without symptoms of one's illness. So what this means is a, a focus or an under focus or understanding that people, even while they're experiencing symptoms related to a, a particular diagnosis like depression or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, that those individuals, even while uh, possibly experiencing those symptoms, sometimes even very significant ways, that these individuals can nonetheless live satisfying, fulfilling, and hopeful lives. Uh, and that is incredibly important for us um, to understand and to focus on. And in other webinars, other presentations, we talk about how supporting people to live these satisfying and fulfilling lives and to participate fully in the community is actually very good for one's mental health and physical health and wellness. Uh, in fact, we've come to call uh, uh, the focus on recovery and community participation and community integration as being a medical necessity uh, that we need to focus on. And uh, one of the areas that we focus on is the importance of supporting college students with serious mental illnesses as a medical necessity. This is something that facilitates and enhances one's mental health and physical health, and it also leads to uh, valued uh, careers uh, and employment long-term. So this is the consumer-oriented perspective, and there are numerous uh, self-reports, anecdotes, stories, uh, other types of research that have really demonstrated that individuals with very significant mental health issues can live satisfying and fulfilling and hopeful lives uh, with or without symptoms being present. So both of these combined are critically important for, really important for us to understand old notions about serious mental illnesses, again, including schizophrenia, or including individuals who at one point in time um, may not be doing well uh, uh, related to their mental health issues, that over the long term, many or most or all of these individuals are likely to be able to live a satisfying, fulfilling, and hopeful life. Uh, and, that, and that is really the context for our conversation about what um, colleges and universities in particular can do to support uh, individuals with serious mental illnesses. So what do we know about the post, about post-secondary students with mental illnesses? Uh, the first thing is um, that I should say is actually we don't know a lot. There uh, is not a lot of data about how many students there are with serious mental illnesses, um, what their experiences are on college campus, um, all of those kinds of things, sort of things. So some of the data that I'll be presenting today are uh, somewhat dated, and uh, we really need to do a better job uh, to understand the, the significance uh, of the numbers of people with significant mental health issues who are on college campuses. But I will start out with this piece of good news in general. And the good news is there are more students with mental health issues enrolled in colleges and universities. And here are two studies uh, from the late 90s that report significant increases at uh, colleges and universities around the country in the number of students who are identifying with mental health issues. Um, I, I talk about this as good news because there are a lot of uh, stories out there that talk about mental health crises and these kinds of things on, mental health, on campuses as if the presence of college students with mental health issues is a a, a bad thing. And uh, I'd like to say that while some of the um, need to attend to the issues that they're experiencing um, is, is great and we need to do more, that it's actually good news that there are more students uh, with mental health issues on college campuses. And we just need to do a much better job in supporting them from a counseling standpoint, as well as supporting them in being successful and, and successfully completing uh, their education. Um, the, bad news, the bad news is that, again, we don't have a lot of data in this area, but the data that we do have suggests that students with significant mental health issues are withdrawing from college prior to completing their degrees. And this is associated with uh, individuals with significant mental health issues are, uh, as being much less likely to have college degrees than the general population. Uh, data reported for, from the National Comorbidity Study in the mid-1990s suggests that 86% of 
uh, individuals who get accepted and enroll in colleges and universities at that point in time, 86% of those students withdraw from college prior to completing their degree. And this is compared to 45% uh, withdrawal rate for the general student population uh, at um, um, uh, um, general college student population uh, that doesn't have significant mental health issues. So college students are getting admitted. They have the capabilities and the preparation to be successful, but for a variety, variety of reasons, um, they are withdrawing and, in general, are not uh, completing their degrees. Um, educational attainment, this is what I was just talking about a second ago, that this is associated with lower, uh, lower levels of educational attainment for these individuals. Uh, they're much less likely to um, uh, complete their college degrees, and uh, they're being much less likely to complete their college degrees is associated with greater challenges in employment. And uh, from my perspective, it's likely one of the primary factors associated with unemployment of individuals with significant mental health issues. So let's talk a little bit about some of the factors that are associated with withdrawal from college for any student, uh, students with or without mental health issues. And the reason I do this is uh, when I talk to some of my colleagues at colleges and universities around the country or my clinical colleagues around the country, the first assumption is that individuals with serious mental illnesses don't complete college because of their illness exclusively, that it has to do with uh, the fact or they believe that it's a fact that if you have schizophrenia or you experience bouts of mania or depression, that that almost uh, automatically explains why you're unable to uh, succeed. And the interventions to reduce that withdrawal, withdrawal associated with the illness are primarily focused on making sure that students receive appropriate clinical services while they're in their college or university. Uh, I completely agree with the need for clinical supports. While individuals are in college, we need better counseling supports. We need to partner better with uh, community mental health agencies and community providers to make sure that people with significant mental health issues, students with significant mental health issues, are getting their clinical needs supported. But it's actually my belief that a large, a large percentage of the reason for withdrawal likely have to do with other factors. And these are some of the other factors uh, that I think we should be looking at. Um, this is the Tinto model uh, having to do with retention and performance in post-secondary settings. And you see that uh, there are some of the individual factors that certainly are associated with retention and, import and uh, performance in colleges and universities. Uh, these include preparation. This is uh, preparation in secondary settings, um, knowing how to study and having the um, initial uh, um, exposure to uh, an academic preparation to succeed at one's college or university. It also has to do with one's intentions to, uh, to stay at that college or university and uh, intentions to perform at a high level, for example as well as one's own expectations about how, how well uh, someone will succeed or how well an individual thinks that they'll succeed um, at that particular uh, um, college or university. The other set of factors, and I have these highlighted in uh, uh, bright red, are the extent to which the student is engaged in the campus institution. Uh, and this has been found to be a major factor that predicts retention and performance. This means engagement in academics. Are they uh, going to their classes? Are they engaged with their faculty? Are they uh, engaged with uh, the curriculum in substantial ways? It has to do with interpersonal engagement. How well are they getting along with other students? How well and how connected are they to uh, faculty and administration and other individuals on campus? And finally, it has to do with engagement in extracurricular life. This is the extent to which individuals are going to the library and going to clubs, going to sporting events, um, involved in the um, involved in the in campus life beyond um, their academic classes. 
So both these sets of factors have been found to be associated with retention and, and performance for general uh, student populations. And uh, the research that I've been conducting or, or had conducted about 10 years ago suggests that engagement in campus life is a major issue for individuals with significant mental health issues. So let me explain. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago or so, uh, some colleagues and I conducted a national survey, and this is a national survey of uh, individuals with serious mental illnesses who have gone to college or who were current students in a college or university. Uh, this is actually the first such study of its, of its kind that had been conducted, and I think it currently remains the first national study of its kind that, that's ever been conducted. And the purpose of this study was to really understand their experiences on college campus, their campus life experiences, how much they were engaged, as well as the types of supports uh, that they received or would have liked to have received that were helpful to them in being successful. And I'll be getting to, uh, to that list in a little bit of the types of accommodations or supports that these students received that they believed were helpful to them in being successful and staying uh, on campus. Uh, so we had 520 respondents from 307 uh, different institutions. Almost 200 were current students at a college or university in the continental United States, and uh, a little more than 300 were former college students with mental health issues. Uh, the sample was predominantly female and white, and we had a, a, a nice distribution of individuals with different uh, mental health conditions. And most of these individuals reported taking psychiatric medications while at college, which uh, we believed is somewhat of an indicator of um, how significant their mental health issues uh, were. Um, students completed a series of measures, including the College Student Experience Questionnaire, which is a uh, normed and standardized measure uh, uh, developed by folks, I think, at, the, at Indiana University. Um, these, this measure included uh, um, um, measures of experiences with faculty, uh, asks uh, how often do you ask your instructor for information, do you discuss your career plans and aspirations with a faculty member, a second scale is the campus facility scale, uh, how often do you use recreational facilities, do you use a learning lab or center to improve study or academic skills. It includes questions about clubs and organizations. How often do you attend a meeting of campus club organization or student government? Uh, those kinds of questions. It has what's called the index of student satisfaction. Overall, how well do you like college? And if you could start over again, would you go to the same institution you are now attending? Uh, as well as other items about their relationships with students, faculty, and uh, administration. So uh, again, we used the data from uh, all of these respondents uh, about the time that they were uh, on campus. And um, here are the means for the uh, sample of students with serious mental illness or with mental health issues uh, compared to the normed mean. This is a, this is a um, uh, mean that was gathered from almost 90,000 college students uh, in the United States. And the idea was to see whether or not college students with mental health issues um, differ from those individuals, uh, most of which we presume don't have mental health issues in, uh, in these various areas. So the first area was their experience with faculty. Uh, the mean that we had was 21.77 on this particular scale. The normed mean was 21.55, and uh, we report the p-values and the effect size. ES refers to effect size. That's how, that's how large of a difference it is between the two groups. Um, is it a small difference, or is, is it a medium difference, or is it a big difference, or is it no difference at all? Uh, on the experiences with faculty subscale, we found no differences between uh, students with mental health issues versus those who uh, did, uh, uh, mostly do not. Uh, on the campus facilities measure, we did find a, a statistically significant difference. A T-score, uh, this is a particular statistic of 13, which is a huge uh, T-score, suggesting a very big difference between these two groups. 
and the effect size was 0.6, which is about a moderate to large difference between the groups. So this would suggest that college students with mental health issues use campus facilities um, much less frequently than uh, the normed and, uh, the normed college student uh, sample. Clubs and organizations, we also found differences. This was a smaller difference. Uh, college students with mental health issues uh, used clubs and organizations, attended these um, much uh, less likely than uh, uh, the norm sample. Uh, we also looked at satisfaction uh, with their campus or college experience at that overall and um, whether or not they would choose that particular college again. And again, we found statistically significant differences with satisfaction. The T-score was uh, a little more than four, um, and college students uh, were less satisfied with their experience compared to a norm mean. College students were, uh, with mental health issues were uh, reported much poorer relationships with other students. They uh, had a 4.113 on this particular scale versus 5.63 for a normed uh, uh, sample of college students, which is a very large effect. So it seems to be relationships with students is a uh, with other college students could be a major issue that uh, that could be addressed and theoretically may have an impact on retention and performance. Relationship with administration for college students with mental health issues was poorer than the general student population and relationships with faculty were also poor. Both of those were smaller effects, but still uh, statistically significant. So um, overall, we found with our, uh, with our measure that, uh, and our survey, that college students with mental health issues um, uh, are experiencing, are having different experiences in general on campuses around the country compared to their peers. One of the questions that we looked at to try to understand what might be, um, what might be driving this a little bit is we looked at uh, especially their engagement in uh, um, campus organizations and campus resources and interactions with faculty is we wanted to understand whether or not perceived discrimination, whether or not they felt like they were treated differently by other people, if that was uh, making them uh, less likely to use campus resources and, and those other types of things. So the first question we asked uh, the same sample is to what extent they feel that other people on campus treated them differently because they had a mental illness. 28% of our respondents said that they did feel treated differently most of the time, which we thought was very significant, about one quarter said that they feel they felt treated differently. Um, and an additional 49% reported that they sometimes felt treated differently. So this was, um, at least from these students' perspective, they feel like, uh, or reported feeling like other people viewed them and treated them differently. We also looked at the relationship between those who reported that they felt treated differently most of the time, did they differ from the other college students with mental health issues who reported sometimes or never or those kinds of things. And we did find that those students in particular who felt treated differently most of the time used campus facilities less than the other students, had less satisfaction with their college, and had poor relationships with faculty administration and especially other students. So I'm sure all of you, like me, uh, this sets off uh, an alarm that uh, it means that we need to address prejudice and discrimination that uh, at least these students are reporting exist on campuses around the country. And I know many of you are, are, are actively involved in doing this, uh, which is incredibly important. And we'll talk about this in a, in a, more in a little bit about different strategies. But um, I would say that uh, this discrimination requires significant amounts of effort to overcome. Uh, and it's something that our mental health month, uh, actually October 10th, um, was that, uh, I guess that was uh, uh, Sunday, was uh, Mental Health Awareness Day. And all of these kinds of things, May is Mental Health Month, all this kind of stuff is wonderful. 
we need to engage in this work to address discrimination uh, every day of the year, every hour of the day. It is so entrenched uh, in our culture uh, and so entrenched, I believe, on our college campuses that it's having a major effect on these students and is likely a significant driver in why these students aren't staying in college, uh, in their college and university, and why they're not being successful. So we have a lot of work to do in this area. Uh, so, what are, so what are some of the strategies for promoting educational opportunities? Um, so uh, I look at strategies in two different types of way. The first I call supports. These are things that we can do directly with the student, uh, with the college student, to assist them in being successful. And I'll give some examples of that in a second. The other types of supports or, or strategies for uh, enhancing retention and performance is to identify and address barriers that affect uh, college students with mental health issues on campuses. Uh, and as I was talking uh, a second ago about the significance of discrimination, for example, for people on campuses, um, some of the research that my colleagues and I have been doing suggests that these barriers, these things outside of college students, likely play a very significant role in lack of participation, not only on college campus, but discrimination plays uh, likely a major role in employment, social relationships, engagement in churches, synagogues, mosques, really engagement in participation in lots of different areas, that discrimination is uh, one of the key drivers for lack of participation. So let me talk a little bit about some of the supports. Um, I know some of you uh, work in offices of students with disabilities, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, and I'm pleased that you're interested. Um, in, as part of this survey, uh, we uh, recognize that Office of Students with Disabilities and the types of accommodations, uh, formal accommodations that they can uh, work with the students to uh, receive is a very significant uh, support for these students. One of the questions we had was the extent to which college students with mental health issues are aware of accommodations uh, and are, um, have used offices of students with disabilities and have received ac accommodations. Uh, this is a slide um, with uh, some bar graphs that allow us to look at differences between the current students who completed our survey and former students. Those, those were individuals who identified themselves as having been at college at some point in their lives, uh, but not currently being in a college and having a mental health issue. So the good news is uh, when we compare these two groups, we see that former students, uh, we see that there's evidence suggesting that current students are much more aware of academic accommodations that are available to them compared to former students. And these former students could have been uh, from a year ago up to I think 30 years ago. So we have a wide range, but overall, uh, we found 71% of current students were aware of accommodations, were familiar with accommodations, uh, and, their, and their right to accommodations versus 42% of former students. We also found that current students were much more likely to use um, offices of students with disabilities. 44% in this survey reported that they had used offices of students with disabilities versus 24% of former students. And finally, 48% of the current students reported receiving some type of accommodation, uh, academic accom accommodation, uh, classroom accommodation, grading, uh, those sorts of things, things versus 26% uh, of former students. So the good news here is that students, current students in particular, and this was about 10 or 12 years ago, so hopefully it's uh, changed um, and it's increased now, current students are much more aware of accommodations than before and offices of students with disabilities, and a fair majority are receiving them, but these same data also indicate that many, many students, maybe up to half, uh, who, might, uh, who might be eligible um, are not receiving accommodations and aren't using offices of students with disabilities. So we certainly have work to do to uh, make students more aware of the availability of accommodations. 
we ask these students, and um, this is, uh, these are some data that I'll report now that many individuals from offices of students with disabilities have found to be very helpful to them as they think about the types of accommodations that students might, students with mental health issues or psychiatric disabilities might be able to receive. Uh, we um, looked at different types of accommodations uh, in different groupings. So uh, this is a table that lists uh, accommodations related to classroom assignments. And uh, you see the different types of uh, assignments or accommodations that uh, we developed um, after talking with different people about things that they have used or would have liked to have used. We asked how many people or what percentage of individuals had used that particular accommodation. So this gives us a sense of how commonly used some of these are. And then we also ask those people who use that accommodation how helpful it is. And here we report from among those who say they use the accommodation, how many found it, what percentage found it to be very or extremely helpful. So let's take um, the first one that we have listed here, substitute assignments in specific circumstances. Uh, so they, this could be an alternative assignment um, of some sort. And 9% of, of uh, students reported that they used that accommodation. 74% uh, said that it would be very or extremely helpful. Uh, let's go down to written assignments instead of oral presentations or vice versa. Maybe this would be related to somebody who has a, um, uh, 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 an issue where speaking in front of other individuals creates a great deal of anxiety, and that may reduce their um, performance. And instead, uh, these students seek uh, some type of written assignment or alternative to the oral presentation. 7% said that they used that accommodation, and almost 80% reported that it was very or extremely helpful. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these in a great, uh, great, great amount of detail. If you'd like to write me, uh, I can send you the paper that we published that reports all of these uh, results. Uh, the second type of accommodations that we looked at were classroom accommodations, things like beverages being permitted in class, using a tape recorder, um, uh, early availability of syllabus and textbooks, uh, uh, tutoring and course materials, um, assigned classmate as a volunteer assist assistant, all of those kinds of things that we called classroom accommodations. And you see uh, a, a wide range in how often these were used. Uh, I think the most used um, accommodation reported by the students, uh, there were two of them, beverages permitted in class and private feedback on academic performance. Um, the item or the accommodation that they reported being most useful or the highest percentage of individuals who said it was very or extremely helpful was uh, modified or preferential seating arrangements. These would be individuals who may be more comfortable sitting in front or more comfortable sitting in back or uh, those kinds of things as an accommodation that uh, they felt uh, was necessary for them to be uh, successful uh, in that particular course. And the last type of accommodations that we looked at, we uh, refer to as grading accommodations. This includes uh, extended time for test taking, which is fairly standard, um, provision of an incomplete grade rather than a failure if a relapse occurred. Uh, this is actually something that uh, most colleges or universities require that at least 50% of course material uh, be completed for someone to be eligible for an incomplete. And this might be an accommodation where uh, it, we might not utilize that 50% threshold. Uh, there might be a student who has, uh, is re-hospitalized early in the semester, and um, maybe it's after the withdrawal uh, period, and um, maybe uh, their being able to get an incomplete or instead of, a, instead of a fail would be important. I know there are other things that can be done um, uh, medical withdrawals and those kinds of things, but sometimes students are not interested in withdrawing. Uh, they'd like to do something to, uh, to complete that particular course. Um, or, uh, right, and there are lots of different ways to go about doing this. Uh, and many, many students reported that that was very or extremely helpful. 82 
almost 83% reported very or extremely helpful, uh, that provision. Um, so the overall uh, conclusions from these data that we've received from this particular survey is that, uh, first of all, uh, it's important for us to raise awareness of rights and accommodations uh, for college students. And again, I know uh, many of you who are working on college campuses are active, actively involved in this, trying to increase awareness of students with disabilities. Uh, it's called many things in many different places, making sure students are aware of their rights uh, to accommodations. But uh, I suspect that we could probably do more, and uh, that would be a, a very important thing uh, to do. Um, we also need to uh, increase awareness of disability office staff about the types of supports that are desired by students with psychiatric disabilities. So the type of survey that we did is only a first start in how we can do this. And hopefully the data that we've generated um, are of interest and are, are helpful to you in thinking about the different types of accommodations that are available to students that you're working with who experience uh, psychiatric disabilities. We would encourage you to uh, talk to your students, to think about different things that might be available to them. I have heard individuals who work in offices with students with disabilities uh, say that they think there are only a small subset of things that um, um, are um, allowed to be viewed as accommodations. And uh, to the best of my understanding, that's, that's not entirely correct, that there are lots of different things that could be considered. And I would encourage uh, everyone to continue to think about the different ways that they uh, and different types of accommodations that might be available to students. And a great start is actually to start or continue to talk to students to come up with this list, uh, just like we've done uh, or we did in this particular survey. The second thing, uh, the type of support that I wanted to introduce everybody to is uh, what's called supported education. Uh, and supported education is something that emerged out of a, a field called psychiatric rehabilitation. Uh, I'm actually a clinical psychologist, but I'm most often identified with this particular uh, discipline of psychiatric rehabilitation. And basically, supported education uh, is intended, or, or the model is intended, to uh, support students with significant mental health issues to stay in school and to be successful. And they do this using a uh, number of different methods. Uh, they have regular contact with students uh, where they stay in touch with them to see how things are going. They provide um, what are called academic, academic adjustment services, helping to make sure that they're in contact with offices of students with disabilities and are receiving accommodations, supporting them around their interpersonal skills, use of assistive technology, making sure that they're utilizing and are engaged in campus, and a whole host of things. It's, um, some people have equated it to an academic coach that uh, specifically works with students with uh, uh, mental health issues. Um, some uh, supported education programs include uh, academic emergency plans, what happens if you do start having issues, and how can we support you uh, uh, when you are having those issues, and in general, um, being available to support the student as they engage with professors or family or other people uh, around their academic success. This is not treatment. It's not what's called case management services, which means helping people make sure that they receive uh, their medical services uh, related to their mental health issues. But instead, it's more of a coaching, more of a support, more of a skill building uh, type of approach. And there is some current evidence suggesting that supported education um, is helpful to students with significant uh, mental health issues. Um, there are different types of supported education programs. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these, but there are uh, some programs that come out of the mental health systems uh, and are based in community mental health centers that partner with colleges and universities. I actually worked with uh, one agency here in Philadelphia called Horizon House 
to develop one of these programs. It's called Education Patient Plus. And um, here you see some information about the ratio of staff people to students, uh, how much these programs typically cost, and um, the importance of developing relationships with um, two- and four-year colleges and universities. Uh, we also have students in this program who are graduate students as well. So uh, these are mobile uh, mental health agency-based programs. There are also call a few college or university-based programs. Uh, my understanding is the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana uh, still has one of these. I, I haven't looked to see if they still have one, but this is a supported education program that is um, partners with uh, the co uh, college counseling and offices of students with disabilities staff to provide supported education. So it's in addition to focusing on counseling needs or accommodation needs, it's providing that additional support. And my understanding is some colleges and universities are um, uh, um, developing these programs and uh, for certain student populations, especially individuals on the autism spectrum, they're actually um, offering this to students for an additional fee as well. Uh, so this is a growing model that I think is um, going to continue uh, around the country to help uh, enhance retention for uh, many students who experience impairments and uh, disabilities. Um, I did want to take a, a moment to talk about a, a unique model of supported education that my colleagues here at Temple University have developed and are uh, currently studying. Um, we have a wonderful uh, individual named Paige O'Sullivan who is overseeing our distance supported education uh, um, intervention. Uh, this is part of a randomized controlled trial that we're uh, allowing uh, or we're recruiting students from any college or university from around the country uh, who contacts us and meets our inclusion criteria to be eligible to potentially receive uh, a support, a supported education approach from a distance using the phone, using uh, Skype and WebEx and other forms of communication, texting, to provide the same types of supports one might receive with face-to-face uh, -face models of, um, of supported education. So we're really excited about this. Uh, Paige is a wonderful uh, interventionist. She's done a great job with this. And we're actually looking for individuals from offices of students with disabilities or disability resource centers to, um, who are willing to distribute information about this particular study to the students that they're supporting. And if you're interested in uh, contacting us about helping us recruit people, please send me an email at msalzer at temple.edu, and I can put you in contact with Katie Pizzichetti, uh, who will help, uh, and uh, Allison Weigel, who can help uh, you get involved with recruitment uh, or help, help you get information out to students so they know about this. Some uh, folks have expressed concerns about whether or not they need university IRBs to participate or not to participate, just to participate, send information out to their students. Uh, for the most part, we're finding that most do not need any special uh, permission or per approval to send information to their students. Um, so if you have concerns about this or if you'd like to talk about this, uh, we'd be happy uh, to do so. Um, so let's look at some other uh, types of supports that uh, are being used around the country. Um, peer support uh, around especially academic issues uh, is also growing around the country. There are different colleges and universities that have developed peer support, one-to-one uh, -one peer support interactions between uh, college students with mental health issues and college students without mental health issues with their peers who do have mental health issues to support one another around being successful uh, in their college experience, uh, enhancing engagement, utilizing, uh, going to clubs and organizations and all those kinds of things. So peer support is a model that uh, appears to be growing uh, nationally. Again, these are reciprocal relationships where students provide different types of support, informational support, emotional support, validation, and appraisal 
you know, helping people examine their own situations and come to their own conclusions about how to be successful uh, at their particular college or in a particular class or a particular situation. So peer support is uh, an incredibly important and uh, uh, likely effective approach to enhancing retention and performance. Uh, circles of support is a, uh, not another model that I won't be able to go into a lot of detail in right now, but the idea is that uh, most of us in our lives are supported in being successful and living our lives by other people who are non-paid professionals. So many of us have family members who are supportive, who we go to when we want help or just to talk things, talk things through or something like that. Many of us have friends, many of us have colleagues, many of us have other people who are uh, beneficial in our lives. Uh, these are data on this slide where we asked the students in the survey that I talked about earlier who, uh, to what extent, each type of individual was helpful, in, helpful to you or valuable to you in your academic experience. 36% of the students who responded said that family were very or extremely valuable, and 35% said friends were extremely or very valuable. These are important resources for us to think about, and a circles of support uh, model uh, involves um, helping to facilitate uh, students utilizing these supports in their lives to better support them on college campuses. And again, if you're interested in talking about how you might go about doing this, I'd, I'd uh, be very happy to talk with you at some point about how counseling centers, offices of students with disabilities can help facilitate these types of circles that are completely directed by the college students themselves. So it really promotes self-determination. They're in charge. It's about meeting their goals, but also how they can um, utilize their natural supporters, their friends and family members and neighbors and all sorts of people to help them be successful uh, in their academic pursuits. So I'm going to um, end with, with the need uh, or with some strategies for identifying and addressing barriers that uh, limit the academic success of students who experience mental health issues. The first I've mentioned a couple of times because I think it's that important that prejudice and discrimination exists uh, to significant degrees on college campuses. It exists in policies, it exists in administration, it exists among faculty and other students, and it's something for us to do uh, a lot more about um, to address it. It's not just raising awareness of mental health issues, which is critically important, but it's about identifying the structural factors and interpersonal uh, uh, factors that are uh, limiting uh, the experiences and the success of students with mental health issues. Um, I can't go into a lot of details, but uh, sometimes universities and colleges have policies that, uh, uh, that might not be viewed as being welcoming of students with mental health issues. Some uh, uh, universities have formal and informal policies that might send the message to a student with mental health issues that they're not desired on campus. Um, and there are other types of things uh, that are present that might uh, be is an issue. So here I point to some resources uh, in particular that might be helpful to you in thinking about how to address some of these uh, uh, barriers that exist on your campus. Uh, one is a a model policy that was developed in partnership with our center and the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Policy and the Law, where they created a model policy for colleges and universities to adopt um, that basically states that we are here, we, we are here and we want students with mental health issues and we will do everything possible to support you being successful on our campus. And it gives other types of uh, details and uh, things that colleges pledge to do to support students with mental health issues. Uh, many colleges and universities have organizations like Active Minds and other student groups. These are also, are also uh, very helpful for addressing prejudice and discrimination, but not enough. 
and uh, student and family advocacy organizations uh, in particular can be incredibly important to helping raise awareness of mental health issues on campuses, but also addressing, identifying and addressing discrimination and policies that might be present on campuses. Um, some other barriers, and this is less of a barrier and more than a set of perspectives, uh, that I've heard over the years in talking to campus administrators about uh, uh, students with mental health issues is that there's somewhat of a wariness that I've heard from some administrators that increasing support to students with psychiatric disabilities might um, lead them, and if they make special efforts, special efforts to uh, attract students with mental health issues, that that might require them to have to water down the curriculum so these students can be successful. And of course, uh, that's not necessary uh, for those of you on the call, that's uh, kind of ridiculous. Uh, but this is something that I've heard uh, over the years and uh, certainly not a very um, accurate uh, perspective on their part. Um, there's also uh, comments that if, they, if a campus does more to attract students with psychiatric disabilities, this might um, require them to provide uh, even more support resources. And I think that that is likely or should be um, a goal. I think it, it is the case that there would be even more support resources, but I think it also fails to recognize that there are already many students with mental health issues and psychiatric disabilities who are on campus already. So, um, and we need to do a better job supporting those students. And obviously we also need to understand that it's less costly to uh, adopt a preventative approach like utilizing supported education models or promoting peer support or addressing policies that reduce retention and performance to students, that these efforts will actually reduce costs for students and their families, but also for the university uh, itself in terms of re-enrollment issues and counseling issues and all sorts of things. So taking a preventive or a population health uh, among all college student perspective uh, could be uh, critically important. And finally, obviously, supporting these students is morally and ethically responsible. So um, let me point you to some resources that are available on our Temple University Collaborative website. Uh, here's a link right there. And again, you can send me an email, and I, I will send out uh, this PowerPoint presentation so you can see it. But we have a number of resources, including the model policy for colleges and universities that I mentioned earlier. We have a very popular document uh, called A Practical Guide for People with Disabilities Who Want to Go to College, as well as your college community, how people with psychiatric disabilities can make the most of their college experience. All of these have been downloaded hundreds of times uh, from individuals around the country, and uh, we hope that you take a look at it. Uh, so I'm going to end and take some questions. I, I want to thank uh, Katie for helping helping to organize this webinar. Uh, and now I'm going to open up to questions and comments. And again, as I mentioned before, you can put these in the, um, in the chat box and Katie will either send them to me or I will take a look at them uh, as well. So Katie did send me one question earlier. Uh, it reads, can you address the financial aid ramifications and difficulties with, 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 when withdrawal is necessary for a short or longer time period. Um, example, failure to make satisfactory uh, academic progress. So um, I will address it. I don't know if I have any particular solutions other than our need to work with uh, federal financial aid rules and how colleges and universities are interpreting these rules around what academic progress um, means for students who experience significant mental health issues. Uh, this is a very important issue for uh, many students with um, significant mental health issues. Um, my concern is that many uh, um, federal policy makers as well as uh, university administrators who are enforcing these kinds of rules might underestimate uh, the likelihood that an individual with uh, a serious mental health issue, a psychiatric disability, can be successful, especially with the proper support for it. 
So I think um, to address these issues, it's a matter of uh, making sure that we're addressing that environmental barrier and um, providing the types of um, supports and information, especially the types of information that is uh, uh, most, most critical. Uh, so I'm looking for other questions or comments. All right. Well, it seems like I've answered uh, all of your questions. <laughs> so um, let me just say that I'm really thrilled uh, that you have uh, spent a little time with us today. Uh, again, please contact us if you'd like the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation or would like to discuss any of the issues that, that I uh, mentioned in this particular webinar. And again, we're also looking for individuals who are willing to get information out about our distance supported education study to students who are utilizing your um, disability services at your college or university, or if you know of ways for us to disseminate information about this study. Uh, so you'd send me an email again to msalter at temple.edu. And I want to thank all of you for uh, spending the time with us today. Have a great day. Bye.